Lenny McAllister is a best-selling author and Republican strategist. He is an Obama Republican in the age of hip-hop, and we're going to talk to him about the State of the Union Address. Apparently, the president is going to outline his agenda uh, for the next couple of years, or at least this year, and uh, we want to talk to Mr. McAllister about it. Lenny, hello. Welcome to the program. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Good to be with you again. All righty. Uh, what do you make of the State of the Union? Will uh, we have Supreme Court justices sitting there shaking their heads and saying no? Will the president be called a liar? Will the Democrats jump up and stand up and applaud and the Republicans sit on their hands? What's going to happen? Well, the last thing will definitely happen. You'll see a lot of that. You'll see a lot of Democrats, particularly those in vulnerable seats, hoping that they can get some momentum from this president's speech. And you'll see a lot of Republicans sitting on their hands. But if you really want to know what the text of the State of the Union is going to look like, just go back to 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. The president's going to say the same exact things. But Americans need to stop looking at and listening to what this president says in January and pay attention to what this president's going to do February from December. He's to talk about income inequality. He's going to talk about trying to bring people together and get people back to work. But the policies he enacts from February through December over the course of his term so far has not quite led to that. Well, what, what does he need to do to achieve his goals if he's talking about income inequality? He talked about raising the minimum wage. Uh, that's, uh, is that going to happen? Is, is that what you're saying? He's unable to achieve those goals? I think that he's more focused on making poor people less poor than he is about making poor people get into the middle class. And that's what he needs to focus on. Everybody talks about saving the middle class. People are falling out of the middle class. So you can't worry about stabilizing those that are in the middle class and trying to save them from falling out. You've got to start looking at what's growing right now in America. And what's growing in America under President Obama in these five years has been poverty. How do you get people out of poverty and back to work where they can sustain themselves and have careers and have vibrant lives again versus just trying to talk about making sure people can keep their kids in college or, you know, infamously, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan. Unfortunately, the State of the Union address have been nothing more than the economic, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan from President Obama over the last several years. Well, you're a Republican strategist. If you were a Republican president, what policies would you put into place to ensure that the middle class remain on solid footing? The first thing I would do is put tax policies in a place that incent people to go into struggling communities and go into communities that have not seen job growth in quite some time. Make the tax incentives there so that people can get back to work there, people can start having businesses there. Then from there, I would make sure that we are bolstering education through all avenues. I'd make sure that public education got the support that it needed. I'd make sure that the charter schools were up to snuff but had the support that they needed. I would make sure that parochial schools, and this is actually something that President Johnson did in the 60s, I'd make sure parochial schools had the support that they needed. If you get education on track and you get poor people back to work and looking to have careers and not just piecemeal jobs, that's how you re-strengthen America. Well, you know, almost every president who's come in has said, I want to be the education president, and uh, we spend more money, and we get fewer, better results. Uh, that's on the Republican and the, the Democratic side. So I don't, I don't know if charter schools are going to be any better or any of those other things, parochial schools. Well, I think that if you look at what's been going on under President Obama, the first thing he did over the first 12 months is he cut funding to HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, at a time where black unemployment was approaching 20 percent nationally through unofficial numbers. At the same time, he's continued to attack voucher programs, both in Louisiana, where he eventually had his DOJ remove their lawsuit against the state of Louisiana, as well as the D.C. Opportunity Program, the voucher program there in Washington, D.C. This has not been a president that's been for education. This has been a president that's but for teachers unions and that's a big difference is as long as he's for special interest and the special interest is not education across the diversity of education we lose on a geopolitical and a geoeconomic sense Lily I have to tell you I, I'm a graduate of a historically black college in Louisiana Grambling and Governor Bobby Jindal a Republican governor has cut funding to Grambling from 34 million down to 18 million they're scuffling they're appealing to alumni my wife and I just sent them a check and got a thank you for it. Uh, the, the, but it, the, what we're doing as alumni uh, is not helping, and that's a Republican governor who cut funding to a historically black institution. 
and there was a Democratic president who's the first African American president that made sure that the policies that were put in place by President Bush and the Republicans during their tenure, when they controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency, he the first thing he did was cut both of those programs. Now, some of that funding has been put back into place recently, but you can't have struggling institutions take hits like that and then you and then wonder why they're on the rebound and why they're trying to basically get by on, on a day-to-day basis. You had Morehouse College that had to literally furlough some employees not too long ago. So, I mean, this is something that started from the top all the way down. Now, of course, I see that, that Governor Jindal is also trying to make sure that poor students down in the state of Louisiana have an opportunity to better education. So this is a governor that has gone through and put some policies into place to help poor people get the opportunity to get the education to sustain themselves. You so know, I admire, your verbal ju- I admire your verbal uh, jujitsu, but it does not jive no, with the facts. facts Chris, I, Chris, these are, it these does are facts. Not, well, did facts. I interrupt you? Come Come on now, let's be civil. Uh, I did not interrupt you. It does not jive with the facts as I know them with people that I talk to on a weekly basis in Louisiana. Well, and I'm not trying to interrupt you, but if you look at the fact of what transpired when President Obama came into office, you look at the types of policies that he has purported. You even look at some of the budgets that he put into place that were shot down by Democrats and Republicans, you will see that some of the initiatives that he put into place, whether it was cutting the D.C. voucher program, cutting the, the education programs for these HBCUs back in 2009 and 2010, or even some of the initiatives that he's put into place since then have been harmful for allowing us to advance ourselves when it comes to chasing the leaders when it comes to education around the world. And I don't know what that has to do with a Republican governor cutting state funding to a historically black college that I graduated from. But again, I admire your verbal jujitsu. <laughs> Uh, here, here's the thing. What about the president's State of the Union address? Do you expect any kind of new proposals that come out of it in terms of income inequality? And does the minimum wage affect that at all? Or you think the tax policy that would make people invest in communities that are economically dysfunctional be better? I think that, well, I think that we definitely need the investment more than we knew the minimum wage coming up. With that said, though, I, I think that there's an argument that can be made that you can at least consider raising that minimum wage. I don't know if we should bring it up to $15 an hour, but to sit there and say that it has to stay at seven twenty-five is something that people should at least look at. I mean, you, you have people that are struggling, and right now, because everybody's working part-time jobs and trying to piecemeal two and three part-time jobs together rather than having full-time jobs, maybe this is something that can be considered. I do expect the president, unfortunately, to focus more on income inequality as far as a a buzzword phrase, as well as go after minimum wage and say we have to raise this. He'll probably propose $10 an hour, maybe even a little more than that. I think that the Republicans will push back on that, but should at least consider moving that number up, considering the economic times. Well, I think there's no doubt about that. If the minimum wage had kept pace with inflation, it would be somewhere around $14 an hour. Lenny, as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I like doing verbal jujitsu with you, sir. (laughs) I enjoyed it as always. God bless you and God bless Pittsburgh. All right, same to you, sir. All right, I'm Chris Moore. We're going to take a look at some other issues when we return. Stay with us for more on Pittsburgh Now. This is so much fun.